background on myself. So um, I've essentially started two companies in my career. One is a nonprofit called Kiva, which I can tell you about uh, for the first half of my talk. And the second is a for-profit called Branch, uh, which I'll spend the second part of my talk on um, describing. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some of the lessons learned along the way doing both experiences, both focused in sub-Saharan Africa, actually. So um, a little bit about Kiva. So Kiva is the world's first ever person-to-person -person lending website. Uh, I started it in 2005 with a couple co-founders. Um, basically, I was traveling in uh, Uganda, actually, as a, as a recent college grad. Um, I had just graduated from Stanford with a degree in computer science and philosophy. I was really interested in uh, existential issues and uh, really restless and wondering what my purpose was in life. I went on this long volunteering trip in Uganda to document stories um, about people that had taken microfinance loans. So microfinance, the practice of lending to low-income people uh, around the world started by the um, Nobel Prize winner uh, Muhammad Yunus from Bangladesh. Um, so I was inspired by that and a little bit uh, tired of my job as a computer programmer at TiVo, where I was, it was a TV company essentially, where I was programming this device uh, for a few years after college, basically uh, helping people pause live TV. That's what I did right when I graduated. And that was our mission. And I was a little bit uh, sort of jaded about that and wondering why I had, had all this education and spent all my years of my life working towards this. Um, but not really feeling fulfilled. Um, so I went on a long journey and found myself volunteering in Uganda and basically was, uh, as a person that wanted to be an entrepreneur at the time, really inspired and enjoyed meeting other entrepreneurs in that part of the world. Uh, as you guys can understand, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's a lot of individual small businesses. Uh, everyone works for themselves. It has some side job, side hustle, um, buying and selling stuff with dreams and strategies. And I enjoyed that. I, I thought um, I was getting into uh, you know, a situation where I was going to see a lot of sadness and uh, poverty and starvation. And I saw those things, but mostly I enjoyed um, connecting with other people like me who had dreams. And I, coming from America, I had some opportunity to like, help them think about how to raise money for that. So. Um, I remember I met this woman, Petronilla, in Uganda, like in a village, and she just wanted to raise money to expand her store. She was selling time cards for phones uh, in a small place outside of you know, a city in Uganda, and um, she needed access to finance to buy more so she could sell more, because otherwise she would be sold out and people would not go to her store to buy them. And she was also um, a single mom, uh, struggling to send her kids to school and needing the profits of this to do that. And I just thought, well, you know, she needs a $300 loan. Um, it's very obvious that she can sell the inventory that she buys with that, with that loan. Why can't she do that? Because certainly we could all raise $300 if we had, you know, access to the internet. And if you could pay back a loan, um, even at a minor interest rate, that seems like, why, why shouldn't that happen? Why is there this lack of capital in these rural places all around the world? Um, so basically, um, I had this idea to start a, a crowdfunding website. There was no crowdfunding at the time, it was 2005, so I didn't know that word. But I uh, just assembled uh, a small team of entrepreneurs in Uganda to post up their stories on this website. Um, we took pictures, they wrote their business plans, and we raised about $300 loans for each of them um, from my family and friends. Um, this is actually the first person that uh, volunteered to be on the site itself. Her name's Elizabeth. She's the first borrower on Kiva. And essentially what she was doing was um, selling fish, like on the side of the street. And she'd buy a few fish every day. But she couldn't buy a lot of fish because she didn't have a freezer. So um, she couldn't store the fish overnight. So she had to buy just as much as she needed every day. Um, so these are the stories of entrepreneurship and microfinance all around the world where people just need a little bit of money to make an, a non-incremental improvement in their business that can really increase their profit margin and help them break a cycle of poverty. Um, so um, fast forward a few months, I came back to San Francisco, built this site and posted Elizabeth to the site um, and I got five people to lend to her. So this is my dad and my co-founder's dad on the top there as, as lenders uh, funded her and still on the site, it's cool. You can go back in time and see all the, all the loans from all of history. She raised $500 to do her simple idea. And you know, people in the, 
in, in these situations have really good ideas, really good business ideas, generally pay back their loans on time, just uh, lack access to capital because the process of getting the money to difficult part, parts of the world uh, is very time consuming and very costly, right? So there's a distribution problem. We felt like the internet could help address that because at that time there were web internet cafes popping up all over rural Africa and small towns and we could sort of use them as an interface. Um, so um, this started working and I quit my job uh, at, as a computer programmer at TiVo um, to do this full time because at a certain point in time, a few months later, I had hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank account that I was wiring back and forth between Uganda, then Kenya and Tanzania uh, to these small NGOs that were collecting and distributing the money. And it got kind of hectic and I felt like if I didn't get a hold of this and quit my job, um, I could get in a lot of trouble because it was just going through my personal checking account. Um, <laughs> so, it's not a joke. <laughs> uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, I met a lot of people, met these people over the internet generally uh, who got really into Kiva and moved to San Francisco uh, from various parts of the world, Australia, Connecticut, and um, different parts of uh, the country um, to help me do this stuff. And so these were the volunteers. We got a small office in the Mission District in San Francisco. This is like 2006. Uh, I had a really good fashion sense at that time. <laughs> and um, this is before the award. So, um, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, so this, this kind of grassroots volunteer effort with no funding um, started to, we started to get control of it, so hired accountants and lawyers and everything, started to get ahead of all the legal issues we would have faced and gone to jail for, um, and figured out where all the money went and sorted it out and started to scale to different parts of the world. And we did that by reaching out to NGOs, like community-based organizations serving the poor in rural parts of the developing world. And basically using them as distribution channels for cash. So they would post up uh, profiles of entrepreneurs in their neighborhood in Cambodia or Nicaragua or, or wherever it be. Um, and they would raise money from our site and uh, hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of people uh, lent to, to those community organizations through the site, um, empowering entrepreneurs in their neighborhood. Um, so this is a, like a long story, but I'm gonna skip all over it because I have nine minutes. Um, and fast forward 10 years later, um, Kiva works in like 80 countries around the world, and we just passed uh, our billionth dollar. So we just sent a billion dollars to low-income people. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I, this is, uh, that was the first part of the story. Second part of the story is um, about a year and a half ago, I got interested in um, using technology to start a bank, a proper bank in Sub-Saharan Africa as a commercial enterprise because I felt like I had all these ideas that I couldn't raise money for at a nonprofit, um, and the, the people of Sub-Saharan Africa and generally the developing world were coming onto the internet for the first time. So there's this mass migration of people that used to use feature phones that are starting to use smartphones today. And for the first time ever, you can access them directly without um, sort of the intermediation of a local community-based NGO. You can actually talk directly to uh, rural, lower-income people all over the world or um, urban middle-class folks in places like Nairobi or Lagos or Phnom Penh. Um, there's this huge migration of people coming onto smartphones all over the world and using the internet for the first time uh, via the smartphone. Um, and so there's this big opportunity to serve them with fintech financial solutions uh, directly and cut out a lot of the, the middlemen, essentially a lot of banks that have old-fashioned practices that uh, still use cash, that still have lengthy applications, that still qualify people and make them wait um, three to six months to get access to financial services or banking. Uh, you can sort of serve them in a branchless way. So I founded this company with a lot of the same people from Kiva um, about two years ago um, to serve them sort of through technology and uh, see if we can scale um, a sort of a Kiva part two, but this in, in this case a for-profit because we need a lot of capital to capitalize a bank. Um, so um, 
I'm a few years into this new journey. Uh, so Branch is a for-profit, socially co conscious company based in San Francisco. Our mission is to deliver world-class financial services to the m uh, mobile generation. So um, I wanted to start a microfinance institution as if it was started from scratch today using the best engineering talent um, and the best uh, technology available because um, it, it really isn't happening in Africa and there's a big opportunity and people deserve modern financial services today. Um, so we're um, building on a few trends. So right now, maybe 20%, 15% of sub-Saharan Africans have access to smartphones and have a smartphone themselves. And they're about $50, $60 in uh, that part of the world. But the population is essentially doubling every year that owns a smartphone. And so we have all these new people that are using the internet for the first time. And so the apps that they're using are WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, um, basic things. And this is their sort of their first experience chatting. So they're really, really enthusiastic about commenting on Facebook, about having conversations, about um, interacting with the internet. Um, and doing banking, they're super trustworthy and interested in getting banking services via this channel because people are pretty disillusioned with brick and mortar banking and even microfinance in, in a lot of parts of the world. So there's a big opportunity and if, if anyone wants to um, get into this business or um, sort of serve underserved folks through fintech in the developing world, please uh, find me on Twitter. My uh, handle is Matt Flannery at Twitter, so um, we can, we can um, discuss over there. Um, but the population of smartphone users is essentially doubling every year, which is a huge opportunity. And in a couple of years, we think that most, over half of Sub-Saharan Africans will have um, access to the internet via the smartphone. Um, banks, so one thing that um, inspired me to do this is just walking around and seeing these banks in places like Lagos, or Dar es Salaam, or Nairobi, and the huge lines outside of them. When I first saw these, I thought, well, maybe someone's on strike. You know, what's, is there a protest? But no, it's just um, banks have no incentive to have great customer service because people are willing to wait for hours to get their paycheck or deposit of cash. And so um, they're not responding very fast and people are starved for liquidity. There's actually um, big slowdowns in traffic, um, big slowdowns in shopping towards the end of every month in many sub-Saharan African cities because people don't have access to credit and they can't buy anything because the paychecks from the government all come at the beginning of the month. So um, there's traffic jams at the beginning of every month in a lot of these places because um, government workers and um, employed peoples get paid and then pay everyone else. Um, so this is basically what I did. I went back to my computer science roots and I built a system for using artificial intelligence to make instant credit decisions to people um, over the smartphone. So people download this simple app. Um, it asks for, uh, to read a lot of your data. So it reads your SMS messages, looks for bank statements in your receipts. It uh, looks at uh, how often you talk on the phone, your data use, and tries to approximate your credit worthiness or your income level um, by looking at um, all, this, all this data on your phone, including the type of phone you have in the model. Um, and then using like artificial intelligence, it instantly makes a loan to you or not, and people can get a loan within 10 seconds or so. Um, so um, one phenomenon that's happening is because people are getting on the internet and using apps for the first time, they're kicking off all sorts of data. There's all this data being generated um, by people in the developing world, and there are no credit unions to speak of. So people don't really have, um, credit bureaus, sorry, people don't really have a credit score that's portable, and so companies like Visa can't really lend to the, uh, the mainstream African because there's no credit score for them. And so you have to rely on these alternative data sets, like how you use your phone, essentially, or other internet sites. Um, and that data is very valuable to inject credit into markets that have no liquidity yet because of the lack of a transparent credit bureau system. So um, the, the rise of big data really enables this kind of tr uh, access to financial services that wasn't really available even like three, three years ago. Um, so just to give you a sense of what we've done, in about a year, we've lent about $40 million and that's growing 10% a month and lent to about 300,000 people um, with over a million loans. So not quite a billion yet, but a fast growth um, because 
um, there's a huge demand and huge appetite for modern financial services all over the world at this moment in time. Um, so I'm just going to end with a few of my lessons learned from being a social entrepreneur. So I've done two very related things, but one through a nonprofit and one through a for-profit. And I've learned uh, basically three big lessons for starting a startup in the social sector, uh, which is work in the field first. You know, my, my experience working in the field with customers in microfinance in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania really informed the rest of my career. And knowing the customer gave me that passion, which, uh, you know, still, I still possess today. And I still do customer service every day to our users uh, all over Africa. Just knowing the customer and being close to them as a startup founder, super important. And it's important to never lose that aspect of the work that you do. Um, Secondly, I think um, I'm able to keep going through a lot of ups and downs through this 10-year journey by just loving what I do. And I think as a startup, you can't really um, do it for the destination because so often you fail. Like, no one's going to start a startup to get rich. Um, they might start it, but um, you'll quickly realize that can't be the reason because it's so hard. And especially in the early days, you get so little feedback and so, so much little love. Um, uh, because you're just in a one-person company that has no traction, um, that you really have to love the work for itself. And even if it didn't work out, you would still be doing something like that because it's beneficial in and of itself. The process is worth it every day, not the destination. And then lastly, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs who um, don't get started fast. They spend the first year or two of thinking about their startup doing research or doing a business plan or talking to mentors. And I just have learned through doing this a few times that um, you learn so much more by just starting and having one customer in the first day that you start than by years of research. I learned so much more by just getting started fast than by talking to people and getting advice and writing a business plan. So generally suggest just getting traction first. Starting something is by far the hardest part of any uh, company in the hardest stage. And most entrepreneurs don't get to one customer. They just do a lot of research. Um, anyway, thanks a lot for listening, and um, I appreciate being here. Thanks to Ashoka and Inspire Fest team.